Lord, we don't say it enough. We don't say it enough. We don't give you the praise. We don't give you the thanks as much as we ought to. But Lord, we're here right now. And we're lifting up our hands to you to acknowledge how great and how awesome you are. Lord, we love you and we worship you. We lift our voices to you, God, because you are worthy. Lord, you're the one that forgives us. You're the one that heals us. You're the one that provides for every one of our needs. You're the, ones that, you're the one that gets us out of trouble when we're in trouble. We lift up our voice to you, Lord, in a time of need, and you're the one that comes rushing in to help us, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, even as we worship you in this place, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit just to fall on our lives afresh. Lord, like dew dropping down from heaven. Lord, like a mist from heaven. Let your anointing just rest upon these moments, Lord. As we go into your word and as we as we pray together, Lord, and as we seek your face, Lord, let the power of the Holy Spirit come, arresting every every force of darkness, arresting every troubled water, Lord, every storm and every rage, Lord, that comes. Father, arrest it all. And Father, I pray that you would release healing. I pray, Lord, for those in this room, Lord, anyone watching online that needs to receive healing, let them receive it right now in your presence, Lord. And I thank you for peace and strength, Lord, coming from heaven into our hearts, Lord, to change us, to shape us, Lord, and to move us in the right direction. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you that you're a living God, close to us, so near to us, Lord. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do for us. And we say, Lord Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. And if you agree with that, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Come on, just tell him you love him. Come on, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. And while you're clapping, give a good clap to these guys right here that are leading us in worship. Thank you, guys. Wonderful job. Where would we be without worship and praise? I tell you, I mean it. I was, I was so depressed last Sunday when, when I came and I didn't have the throat to sing. It's a sad thing. But I tell you, I've got something to sing about. How many got something to sing about? I uh, Coming out of... You know, the Thanksgiving holiday, Kathy and I had a wonderful time. Of course, before that, we the privilege of uh, leading 43 gateway people uh, for nine or ten days in Israel. That was just uh, an amazing, amazing journey, and we had such a blast. But it took me away from our normal everyday life. You know, you get out of your routines and you do something different. Then we came back from Israel a little tired and... <clears throat> Uh, a little frog in our throat and recovering from that and then right into the Thanksgiving holiday. So kind of been out of the out of the normal swing for maybe 10, 12 days here. But going through the Thanksgiving holiday, as I'm sure was the case for you, you step out of your, your normal routine and you do a little thinking, you do a little reflecting and hopefully gratitude bubbles up in your life and Kathy and I just want you to know that as we think about you, as we think about this role that God has given to us uh, as leaders and the team that God has given to us that we appreciate and love so much, we are just so honored and so grateful for each and every one of you. It is such, and I mean this with all my heart, it is such a joy and privilege to pastor and lead God's people. It's an honor. It's a great thing. We, we get to go through life with you guys, and we don't just show up and preach a big message and then split and leave town. We're walking through life with you. We're there with your weddings and your funerals and your milestones and your moments and, and uh, sharing life with you and then, and then sharing God's word, hopefully in ways that are relevant to your life in helping to shape your, your walk and, and helping you to... Uh, be formed as fully committed, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. It's a tremendous, uh, tremendous joy that we do not take for granted. I don't think I say it enough, but it is, I'm having a blast. You're not looking at one of these burned out, tired preachers that hates people, 
hates ministry and is just sick of the whole church thing. I'm not sick of it. I'm having a blast. We're, are we having fun? Are we having fun? We are having fun. And, uh, and, uh, and I love these people that I work with. And, and Kathy and I just love you guys and we're, we're very, very thankful. And I think it's important to say so every now and then. And maybe this would be your cue uh, with your family members and your friends and the people that are important to you, make sure you tell them how you feel. Don't say nice things at their funeral. Say nice things to their face. Amen. And let's show the love and let's show our appreciation and honor for each other. We love you guys and we thank God for you. Now, I want to challenge some things that challenge you today. I'm after some things today that are bothering you, that are hassling you, the fear that hits you, the anxiety that hits you, the worry that hits you. And here's my, here's my weapon. All right. You ready for my weapon? With God, there is more than enough. Can you say that with me? With God, there is more than enough. And that's what we've been talking about for several weeks here. We're talking uh, about practical things like finances and loving God and what that looks like. But I want to just lay a foundation with some scriptures. And I, I want to say to you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what might be uh, hassling you or attacking you in your mind, maybe you're going through a, a rough time in your marriage. Maybe you're having a hard time financially, struggling, uh, health issues, uh, aging issues, uncertainty. I want to just, I want to challenge those voices that are challenging you by saying to you that if you have God, you have more than enough. Can we look at some scriptures today? Psalm 37, day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts, how long? Forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Now, God never said you wouldn't have hard times, but he's, here's what he promises. You won't run out in hard times. You will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have, say it with me, more than enough. Does anybody in this, does anybody in this room believe that verse? Then why aren't you excited? Hallelujah. Everybody say more than enough. <laughs> hey, look, hey. Hey, I know the devil's talking to you. I know you're wondering, what, you know, is, is the housing thing going to downturn? Or what are they going to do? Is the stock market going to turn up or turn down? Or what's going to happen in Washington, D.C.? And what's going to happen in California and all the stuff that's going on? And, but, I, but I'm telling you, I'm not worried about what they do in Washington, D.C. I'm not worried about what the news says because I know what God says. Come on, I've got a promise that I'm going to have, even in hard times, I'm going to have more than this. So bring on the hard times. Let the hard times roll. Let the hard times roll. I got a promise, I'm saying, and I'm not nervous. I'm a believer. I've, I've, I'm a person of faith. And I believe what God has said. And I'm going to have more than enough, even in hard times. Psalm 23, the famous shepherd's psalm. The Lord is my best friend. And my shepherd, I always have, say it with me, more than enough. You see, when God is your friend, when you really make the Lord your shepherd, and I don't mean, you know, being a church lady or a church guy. I mean, you really come into covenant relationship with God. And he is your shepherd. He is your friend. You know him. You rely on him. When you have that place in your life, it releases peace. Don't you understand? It releases something on the inside of you that is unshakable, even in the hard times. And even though when David was walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but I fear nothing because I've got a friend right beside me. And I'm always going to have, say it with me, more than enough. You getting anything out of this? I got a hundred of these verses. I'll keep going until you smile. I will, I will flat preach the word of God to you until you agree with it. Until it gets into your heart. Until it gets into your spirit. You walk out of here saying, you know what? We're going to have more than enough. I'm not nervous. I'm believing. Right? Let's look at a few more. 2 Corinthians uh, 9 is a giving chapter. It's a chapter about church collections, kind of like, like we've been receiving here. And, it said, and Paul makes this promise to the givers. And God is able to give you more than you need so that you will always have 
all you need for yourselves and more than enough for every good cause. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, even leading a church and with all the things that we need to do and want to do, and you think about missions and you think about uh, reaching people and you think about taking care of the needs here in this house and children's ministry, youth ministry. You think about church in five locations and, and salaries and pastors and facilities and all of that stuff. And you know what? This is all a good cause. We are on the right task. And when we are doing what God has called us to do, he said, don't worry about the bill. I got it. We're going to have more than enough. And that blesses me. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is a verse for somebody in this room that's struggling with shame, struggling with fear. You feel bad about a habit or an issue in your life and you know it's not right. And, or, you're, or the enemy's attacking you. See, Paul the apostle was under attack when he, when he wrote these words. The enemy was hammering him. And I've been hammered by the enemy before and I don't like it. And I know you've felt that experience too. You've, you know the battle is real. But here's what you need to remember when you're being hammered in every direction. Jesus answered Paul and he gives this promise to each of us. My grace is always, say it with me, more than enough for you. That means that what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you in dying for you Dying that your sins could be washed away. That was more than enough to handle the devil. That was more than enough to handle your habits and your hang-ups and your hurts. That his grace is able to take you through every trial, through every difficulty, and deliver you totally and completely. That you're not just going to barely make it. You're not going to squeak by the skin of your teeth into heaven. You're going to come roaring into heaven. Totally victorious. Totally free. Totally healed. It's all for you because of God's grace. And I want to encourage you. If you're fighting battles today. God's grace. Hallelujah. God's grace. Everybody say grace. Hey, that is grace is more than enough. So, so bring life on. Bring it on. Face it boldly. And don't be nervous and don't be thrown off. If you get laid off next week or the housing market goes sideways on you or the stock market goes the wrong way on you or Somebody in Washington, D.C. or Sacramento does something that you don't know. Just hold steady. Because the world can rock and the world can roll and all those things may happen. Hard times come, hard times go. But no matter what, you and I, you and I, we're going to have more than enough. Can I have an amen here today? I don't know. I can stop right there. I could stop right there and that'd be a good message. Everybody say more than enough. But you know I'm not going to stop right there because I got more written down on my notes. But I just want to make sure that gets into your spirit because I know some of you are nervous. You worry about retirement. You worry about houses. You worry about your kids. Everybody say more than enough. Get that in your spirit. Because if you look at life like you're not going to have enough? This, this is the way a lot of people live. This is what's right here. I'm not going to have enough. There's something on the inside. You're constantly saying, I'm not going to have enough. We're, we're not going to have enough. That something bad is going to happen. We're not going to have enough. And when you have that thing on the inside of you, it affects everything you do. I promise you it affects your relationships. I promise you, it affects the way you spend money, the way you see money. It, it, it affects the way you give or, or do not give. It affects every part of your life. If you, if you approach life like this, I'm not going to have enough. I lack. I, I don't have enough. If you live that way, it will torment you. You'll be nervous. It'll affect your health. I'm going to promise you that. You got to get this into your spirit. I'm prophesying to you right now. You got to get this. You got you to settle this in your heart. You're not a person of lack. 
You're the son or daughter of a wealthy king. The creator of heaven and earth is your father. And do you think there isn't one of you that would let your children starve? Not one of you. And you think your father in heaven, after he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, watched his only begotten son bleed out for your sins and my sins. You think he went through all of that so that he could then let you starve? You think the same God who gave his own son out of love for you would then step by, stand by, and watch you falter and fail? I tell you, you better come up to date with who God is and what he does because this great and glorious God has given everything to provide for you. Now receive it and say, this is mine. I'm going to have more than enough. And I'm not living from a starting point of, of lack any longer. I did, lack is not my starting point. Lack is not my attitude. It's not my, my starting point from today on is I'm going to have more than enough. Can you get that into your spirit? If you're with me on that, say amen. amen. Because what I'm preaching to you will change your life. It'll change your stomach. It'll change your sleep. It will settle you. It will relieve you of anxiety. You've got to believe what I'm saying. And I refuse to go any further in this message until you shout hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, all right. Are you getting this? Somebody needs to hear this today. I might finish this outline and I might not. But one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to land. I'm going to land this point until you feel it in your heart, until you believe it. Everybody say this, I'm going to have more than enough. The Lord is my shepherd. Say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. I'm going to have more than enough. Amen. All right. But do we have a, do we have a part in this? Is this just going to, is this going to drop down from heaven or, or do we have a part in this? We've been talking in this series about the fact that, that we're going to have more than enough, but we have a, the promise, which is God's going to give us more than, more than enough, has a premise. And that is that we are certain kind of people, that we have a generous heart, for example, that we are scriptural tithers. That's a very important thing. But also today I want to talk, and we talked last week about the tithe, which is that 10% that we're going to give to God. But what about the 90% that we're not giving to God? What do we do with that? And so I want to talk about that. We covered the 10. Now the 90 involves you and I living as stewards, as managers, and being smart, being, having financial intelligence, having wisdom, the wisdom of God for how to manage and how to be uh, people who are experiencing more than enough. And if there was anything that I would want you to remember about this message, it would be this, that we will experience more than enough when we live like God owns it all. Everyone say, God owns it all. The title of my message today is, God owns it all. Whose money is it anyway? <laughs> Government people will say, well, it's our money. We'll give you a little bit back. That's what they sometimes believe. Maybe in Sacramento, maybe in Washington, D.C. Some Christians even, especially, uh, I mean, a lot of people, but even some Christians will say, well, it's my money. I earned it. Those are the same people that will say, it's my body. It's my life. But I don't want to know what they say in D.C., and I don't want to know what people say. I want to know what God says. And do you know what God says about whose money is it anyway? Uh, God says, it all belongs to me. Recently, some very lovely people in our church uh, made 
Kathy and I a, a very nice offer. They own a condo in Squaw Valley. And they said to us a couple of months ago, why don't you think about if you ever need to get away and go just rest for a couple of days, you work hard, you know, go up, enjoy our, go up, enjoy our condo in Squaw Valley. It sits empty a lot and you can go use it. And I thought, well, that sounds, heaven and earth did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, that just felt like God to me. And so we found some time and we took a couple of days, I think it was two nights or maybe three nights. And we went up and we just enjoyed that beautiful, now there was no snow. I'm not a snow person anyway, so that's just fine. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be wet and cold. I want to be dry and warm and cozy. So enjoy the snow. I like to look at your pictures of snow, but I don't want to live in the snow. I don't want to be in the snow. I'm from California, don't you understand? How many are with me on that? Okay, if you love snow, don't get your feelings hurt, but I'm not a snow person. But here we are in this beautiful condo looking out at the gorgeous scene, looking out of their window, sitting on their chair, using their coffee pot. And, and I, didn't ha- I don't have to pay the taxes. I, see, I don't want to own a condo in Squaw Valley. I want to know people. <laughs> I don't want a boat. I want to know people that have boats. How many understand what I'm saying? I don't want the bills and all that. But there we are, just enjoying that beautiful. But that place wasn't ours. How do you think my host would have felt if I had decided, you know, I think while I'm here, I'm going to, I don't really like the color on these walls. I think I'm going to repaint these walls. And actually, this this picture would look better on that wall. And I'm going to turn the sofa around and move things. I mean, I want to make this, you know, I mean, I think that would be pretty nervy. How many think that would be nervy, right? Well, because I'm not an owner, I'm, I'm just enjoying the use of. Now, when I talk to you about how we look at finances, how we enjoy a good life, how do we, how do we, here's what I want to say. God is willing to let you use his condo. You can look out his window, you can enjoy all the stuff, but don't forget who is the owner of it all. Are you with me on that? And so, I, hey, I don't need to own it. I just want to know God. He provides all of our needs. That's why I know that I'm always going to have more than enough. See, it doesn't hurt my feelings that God owns everything. That's not a problem to me. That's awesome. What that means is my father who is wealthy and loves me and wants me to enjoy good things. I got access to everything that belongs to God. I mean, that's the best deal in town right there. So when you live as though God owns it all, it gives you peace. It gives you joy. It it means you're satisfied. You don't have to run after money because you got all the money you can handle. You have access. Your father is the owner of it all. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? So this is what I want to, I want to talk to us and get this into our spirit a little bit because when we understand that God owns it all, it actually fills you with faith. Let's look at the Bible. Psalm 89, verse 11. Whose money is it anyway? Well, here's what the Bible says. Psalm 89 says, the heavens are yours, the earth is yours, and everything in the world is yours. And how do we know it's his? Because he created it all. How many of you know when you make something, it's yours? Now, God created you. Did you know that? So what does that mean? That means he owns you. And he, he created this world. He created Maui and Squaw Valley both. He created the desert. He created the mountain. He even created the snow. I'll, I'll give him credit for that. He created everything. It's all his and, and we get to freely enjoy those things. That is awesome. Now, here's how God owns it all concerning you, concerning your body. Because again, some people will say, well, it's my body. Actually, not true. Because God created your body, didn't he? So really, it's important that you manage and take care of that's not your condo. That body that you're living in, that's not yours. That was created by God and owned by God. And not only that, 
but you belong to God in a second important way. Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that means one day you and I did the dumbest thing we could do, which was to sign on with the enemy. Back in the Garden of Eden, we sold our soul literally by sinning and disobeying to God. We came under the ownership of Satan. Well, that didn't last long because Jesus came to redeem us. What does redeem mean? It means he bought us back. And what price did he pay to buy us back? The price of his own blood. He purchased you and I. The Bible says this, you are bought with a price and your life is not your own. So what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is even your body, even your future, even your gifts, your abilities, your calling, not only, not only you, but the whole world, God owns it all. He owns you twice. First, because he created you. And second, because he redeemed you. Now, how many of you are glad that you belong to the Lord? Everyone say this, I belong to God. My life is not my own. This is, this is what's going to bring us into peace and rest. Because we, we, the reason people are having nervous attacks and anxieties and problems is that they feel they've got to control everything. They forgot that God is the owner and the master of it all. So if you get sick in your body, you can say, Lord, uh, what are you going to do about this body that you paid for? I'm believing for you to make me well because I belong to you. And so your transmission comes out. The mechanic says, it's $2,700 and, and change to fix your transmission. We say, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're not the owner. Who's the owner? Whose transmission went out? God's transmission. Thank you. Did you guys have too much turkey? What's going on with this crowd today? <laughs> Whose transmission is it? So who's got to pay that it be fixed or figure out what's going to happen next? Do you understand the peace that's available to you? If you really live like God owns everything. All right, another verse, 1 Chronicles 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours. Whose money is it anyway? It's his. Yours is the kingdom, Lord. You are exalted in heaven above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over it all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. So do we know the answer to the question, who owns it all? Once you get that, then you set yourself up as a steward. Now, what is a steward? A steward when I was in that nice condo, I had the key. I was responsible. I needed to lock the door. I needed to make sure that the, that the thermostat was set right. I needed to make sure that everything was used properly because I was being trusted to, in essence, steward over, manage, as long as I was there, make sure that everything was right. So I took out the garbage and I made sure we didn't, you know, uh, spray ketchup all over the couch and all of that because I'm a, I'm a manager, I'm a steward. Same thing for you and I. When God is the owner, then we are in a position of responsibility. And with that position of responsibility comes our piece of making this all work. Luke chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. Jesus said this, A faithful and sensible servant is one to whom the master can give, underline this phrase, the responsibility of managing. The responsibility of managing his servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there's going to be what? A reward. How many like rewards? I like rewards. I like, the, I, like, I like for God to say, good job managing. Nice. Here's a blessing. Good job taking care of your life. Good job managing your marriage. Good job managing your finances, your, your, your wealth, your, uh, your health. Good job. You did right. You took care of it. You weren't perfect. It, it was, it, I don't need you to be perfect. But you managed. And you were careful. And you were smart about it. 
And now I'm going to bless you. And so what happens is we start living for the reward and the blessing of being wise and faithful stewards. This brings us such peace. This brings us joy. Now there's three areas, very quickly, that we will all have to manage at one point or another. We're all going to manage our time, our talent, and our treasure. I'm not going to talk about time and talent today, but time, of course, we all have the same number of minutes, hours, days, and weeks in a year, so we have to manage that. Are we, are we being wise with our time? And then there's our talent. It's important that uh, we bring to the table the gifts that God has given to us. Throughout Scripture, we find people withholding their talents. No, I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, I can, I'm skilled at this area, but I, I don't want to do it. I, I'm too humble. I'm too... No, but that's, that's a lack of management. When you have an ability to do something, God expects you to use that because he gave you that ability. He expects for you to use that, not to, not to be stingy with your talent. I don't have time to talk about that. But God wants you to be generous with the gifts that he's given to you. Use it or lose it. Use what God has given you. You say, but I can't sing. I don't know. But you got, you're a 10 at something. You're great at something. Use that for the Lord and watch how God will bless you. And then there's treasure. That's the, the money, the financial part. That's the part that we're talking about in this series because we're trying to land uh, a different kind of economy, a different kind of thought process for God's people concerning something that is so relevant, which is money. You say, I can't believe I came to church today. I can't believe I came to church. This guy's talking about it. He's talking about money. What does that have to do with anything? Well, uh, probably a lot in your life when you actually come down to think of it. Money is a pretty relevant, pretty relevant topic for every single one of us. You, you don't believe me? Try living without it. If you don't think it's important, you don't think it's relevant. In fact, money is so relevant that God, ha God spoke about it. Did you know, for example, that there are 450 verses in the Bible about heaven and hell? Did you know that there are 500 verses on faith in the scripture, but there are 2,300 verses on managing money in the scripture? In fact, Jesus talked about money more than any other subject, more than heaven, more than being born again. And those are, those are important topics because Jesus knows it's relevant. It's relevant for us to have this discussion and talk through money. So here's what I want to say. Every believer is called to be a financial manager for God. I want you to see God is loaning you his condo. That money in your wallet, that money in your bank, that IRA, that 401, 3CB, whatever those are. All of that stuff, your car, I should say God's car. Your body, every, everything concerning your financial life actually belongs to God. He's loaning it to you, and he wants you to use it for his glory, his purpose. And with that comes access to everything that God has and tons of peace. So let me give you four things that for many of you, you've heard this before, but you know, it won't hurt you to hear it one more time. And there's going to be some people in this room that have never heard these things before. I want to talk to you about what the Bible says, four things about how we can be great managers of what God has given us. Number one, we've got to work diligently. Now, whatever generation you're from, maybe you're from the World War II generation, like my father, who worked and worked and worked and my dad worked uh, from the time he was probably four. Actually, my dad was shining shoes on the streets of Chicago at five years old. Everybody in my father's crazy Italian family had to work. And I mean, starting at, at, at five. Then after he served in the military, uh, he got into the financial services industry where he stayed in the same job, the same field until he was 54 years old. And he retired 
And at 54, they started sending him pension checks. And he's 88 years old, and he's still getting his checks. Like, that's crazy. I'm 57. He's been getting checks since he was since he retired at 54. Those kind of deals are not so available anymore. Have you noticed how the, how the world has changed? And now there's something called the gig economy, and people are doing a little bit of this, and a little bit of Uber, and a little bit of eBay, and they're, you know, they're gigging. You know, they're doing all kinds of things. The, the way people earn money has changed over time, and the way retirement benefits are paid out, and the way people plan, the way the way the well you know our relationship with money and wealth is very different but whatever generation you're from here's something that has got to apply in your life work 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 unless you're disabled unless unless something and and we'll believe God with you for God's provision and blessing but if you're able to work you can't be sleeping until noon and then coming to Sunday church saying I receive it I receive it I claim it and expect to live how God wants you to live. How many understand what I'm talking about? All right, we, we, have, we have a part in this now. So, so we got to be diligent in our work life. And that means, basically, can I just say, hit the ground running. You got to hit the, you got to hustle. And, and that's good. That's not a curse. That's a blessing that God will give to you. Genesis chapter 2 said, we've been working since the Garden of Eden. God said, get it done. And he talked about the power to get wealth in Deuteronomy 8. What do you think the power to get wealth is? Just to speak it? How many people do you know that just speak wealth? How's that working for you? Now, I'm a faith person, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge. Sometimes we get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. So we live our whole life claiming, 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 naming and claiming, and got nothing because we never got off our biscuit and, and went out and made our part happen. How many understand what I'm talking about? All right, it's getting quiet, so I'm going to stop. Work diligently. And if you believe that, say amen. Number two, spend carefully. Be wise about your spending. Are you a spender? Come on now. You're a spender, aren't you? I can see it in your eyes. <clears throat> You were at that Black Friday. You were all over Black Friday, weren't you? It's okay to enjoy things, but, but be careful. Be careful with your spending. The Bible says the wise store up. They don't spend everything they earn. There's a few approaches to spending. Which one are you? There's a, the first approach, which is living beyond your means. In other words... If you make $50,000 a year, you spend $75,000 a year. That's called living beyond your means. And that's why your phone is ringing. You're very popular <laughs> with credit card companies calling you. They love you. They want, they want to talk to you. They want to, they want to counsel with you, right? So that's a bad plan. Then there's another way of, of spending, which is living within your means, which is better. How many agree with that? Live within your means. You make $100,000 a year, spend less than $100,000. You're good. That's a... But there's one, there's one even better, and that is to leverage your means, to live far enough beneath your means so that you have enough to give, to invest, hello, to set aside for saving, to, to leverage your earnings for a better life. And this is where, and don't be ashamed if, if you haven't lived this way. Some of you weren't taught this. You didn't know this until you were 55, 60, looking at retirement, and suddenly you're going, oh, man, I think I should have done something differently. How many believe God will help you? He will help you. You're going to have more than enough, but commit to the proper, commit to the proper uh, spending, time and le uh, spending plan and leverage your means. Everyone needs, now, don't get mad at me, please, because I said this word on a Sunday morning. Everyone needs a spirit-led. Everyone needs a spirit-led. I know you hate that word. But a spending plan is a smart thing. Say, well, I'm prophetic. 
I just go with the Holy Ghost. How's that working for you? I believe, I believe in faith. I believe, I, hey, I'm, I'm prophetic. People fly me around to, to prophesy. I, I'm, a, I'm a prophetic person, okay? But having a plan is totally prophetic. When you hear God and he gives you a plan, that's prophetic. You say, well, I'm a faith man. I'm a faith person. I'm a faith man. Okay, well, the greatest statement of faith that there is is a plan. Get a spending plan and say, by God's grace, this is what we're going to do with our money when he blesses us and this is how we're going to manage. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move so fast because I am not getting a lot of amens on the budget thing here. <clears throat> you know I'm right. Number three, give freely. And I, I tell you, generosity, God wants us to have a generous heart. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, whoever sows sparingly, we got that. We understand. It. We, we reap in proportion to what we sow. And God loves a cheerful giver, and he wants us to be generous. And it's all about the heart. Can I tell you this? Everything in your life is about the heart. Everything. The Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it, Flow all the issues. All the issues. That word issues means boundaries. Out of it flows all the boundaries of your life. The structure of your life flows out of your heart. And if you have that chintzy gene that we all sort of have, that I don't have enough and I got to keep what I've got, that really affects your life. But when you get that freedom gene, when you get that, gen I'm going to have more than enough, and you're able to give that way, it does something to you. So generosity, nobody wants to be around a stingy person. You, your stinginess affects your relationships. It, it affects everything. So, so be a generous person. Uh, I love this uh, eternal quotation from missionary Jim Elliott, who uh, gave his life, died as a martyr serving God, one of our heroes of faith. He said, he is no fool who gives up when he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. What is he saying? He's saying, give it all. Give, give it all and, and be generous. Give freely. And number four, I'll close with this. Plan wisely. I know this is not a, I know this is, this is like a couple of steps above a visit to the dentist. You know what I mean? This is a, I get it. I understand. I understand. But I love you enough to talk to you about the stuff that matters and that's relevant in your life. Be a planner, the plans of the diligent. Get a plan from God. Get a financial plan. Sit with the right people. If you're not good with money, sit with people that are good with money. And say, can you help me? I'm 62 years old. I need a plan. I'm 21 years old. I need a plan. And, and let a plan, a faith plan come. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. He wants you to be wise for the future. Learn to save and learn to invest. And at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. Live like God owns it all. If you live that way, you're going to have peace. You're not going to be anxious. You're going to have more than enough. You're going to sense I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm not going to fear any kind of evil because I have a friend. I'm in relationship with God and I'm going to have more than enough. Amen? How many want to live this way? Let's live this way. Let's acknowledge who God is and let's believe that we're going to have more than enough. Bow your heads, everybody. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your grace, Lord. I thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Lord, as we face a new year, as we face the holidays, as we, as we face our school bills and raise our families and think about our golden years and all that is ahead, I pray that fear would be broken, Lord, from our lives. That we will have such a sense, Lord, of your power and your authority, Lord, in our lives and we will never doubt 
the sufficiency of what you've done. Lord, we acknowledge you as the owner of everything in our lives. We bless you, Father. We thank you for guiding us. We thank you for providing for us. Thank you, Lord, for letting us use your condo, our body, our food, everything. It comes from you. May we, may we be honorable. May we, may we, Lord, please you in the way we manage what you have loaned and made available to us. We praise you for this, Lord. Just leave your heads bowed, if you would, kindly for a moment. We're going to close the service here. It's just a matter of moments. We're going to sing. We're going to bring our tithes and offerings to him. I'm going to speak a blessing over you as we dismiss. But I, I cannot close this service without taking 60 seconds to make an invitation to anyone here who is away from God. You're out of alignment. You're out of sync with God. You, maybe, maybe you used to serve him, but somehow you've drifted. If that's you, I want to invite you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never known the assurance of salvation. You've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't want to close this service without giving you an opportunity to surrender to him, invite him into your life and start the rest of your life forgiven, free of the shame, free of the guilt, free of all sin and knowing that you've got a home in heaven waiting for you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I would never embarrass you. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I'd, I'd like to pray for you if you'll let me know who you are. I want to pray that God will break through in your life, that he will bless you as never before, that he'll give you a brand new life. Old things have passed away. All things become new. If that's you and you'd like me to pray for you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just lift your hand. Say, Pastor David, that's me. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Just lift it up wherever you are. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Maybe you're online. Just indicate online. You can see right there what you're supposed to do to let us know. We want to pray for you. I see your hand. Thank you for putting that up. There's three hands. Is there a fourth hand just to say, Pastor, pray for me? You know what I believe? I believe God is touching hearts. I'm going to ask every Christian to be praying with me right now because you know how important this is. I see your hand. Thank you. You know how important this is. I see still another hand, five people. Wonderful. Every Christian praying. Lord, we just agree right now for these precious five that are lifting their hands. I'm asking you, Lord, to break the power of sin. Break the shame. Break the sadness. The heart sickness. Take it, Lord. Wash them clean. Jesus, what you have done is amazing. Thank you for dying, for the, dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the grave for our justification. Redeem these five lives, Lord. Buy them back, Lord. Snatch them from the jaws of hell and make them secure in your love. I praise you for this. Holy Spirit, touch them deeply. Empower them to live this life, Lord, through the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, would you all say amen? Can we say hallelujah for five people lifting their hands in this service and making a decision for Jesus? Baby, that's what it's all about. And there were four in the first service. Not a Sunday goes by that we don't lead people to Jesus. That's so important. I'm going to say to those that raised your hand, there's a card right in front of you. You heard about it earlier in the service. It says, I've decided. Would you take a minute, find a pen. It's right in front of you. Fill out that card. And when the offering container comes by, drop that card in. Let us know officially what decision you've made. I've given my life to Christ. Let that be your official way of saying this is it. I mean business with God. Because if you mean business with God, he means business with you. Amen. I believe today is the first day of the rest of your life. What a glorious thing. There's a prayer we're going to put up on the screen. I'd like to invite everyone to say this prayer. And then the worship team's going to lead us. We're going to have about two minutes of worship while the ushers gather the 
the offerings. Thank you for your commitment cards. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing your very best for the Lord. Let's say this prayer, can we? Everybody, out loud. Here we go. Father God, thank you for meeting my needs and caring for me. Help me to see you as my generous, loving Father. I acknowledge you as the Lord of my life, and everything I have comes from you. Help me to live and invest wisely for my future and the kingdom of God. I will be... Oh, that's so good. Let's all say it together. I will be a wise steward of what you have entrusted to me in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give. I'll be right back. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. Nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. my friends here they're ready to pray for you if you came today thinking man I just need somebody to pray with me I'm sick I I got a problem in my life I need prayer that's what these folks are here for so your need is very important to us let's all stand together I'm going to speak a blessing on you and I'm going to speak the blessing of Abraham on you because the father of our faith Abraham was an employed man he was a wealthy man he did not struggle financially and here's what I'm believing for 100% employment in this house, 100% prosperity in this house, 100% tithing in this house, and 100% peace and debt free. How many will agree with that? All right, so let's believe this. You might, it might take you a minute to get there, but let's believe. Let's believe that it's real and that it can happen. Lift your hands. Father, we bless you for what we've heard in this place today and how you've touched us and loved us and provided for us. Now, Lord, using the authority that you've given to me, I bless your people with a, with a blessing of Abraham. By faith, Lord, your word says we receive the blessing of Abraham. So, Lord, let it rest on us. We will have more than enough. We will be debt-free. We will be prospering, and we will not be unemployed. Lord, 100%, we believe you for it. In Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. Amen. Guys, I love you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed with the blessing of the Lord.